Ibn Khaldun, Arabic, Abzaid Bidi Alarman bn Memdi bn Kledon Aldermi Abu Zaid Abd ar Rahman ibn Muhammad ibn Khaldun al Hadrami, May 1332 to 17 March 1406, was an Arab historiographer and historian. He is widely considered as a forerunner of the modern disciplines of historiography, sociology, economics, and demography. He is best known for his book, The Muqaddimah or Prolegomena. Introduction. The book influenced 17th-century Ottoman historians like Khatib Celebi, Ahmed Sevdet Pasha and Mustafa Naima, who used the theories in the book to analyze the growth and decline of the Ottoman Empire. Also, 19th-century European scholars acknowledged the significance of the book and considered Ibn Khaldun to be one of the greatest philosophers of the Middle Ages. <laughs> Family Ibn Khaldun's life is relatively well documented, as he wrote an autobiography, Altrif Babin Kledon World Gerba Shirka at Ta Rif by Ibn Khaldun wa Rilata Garban wa Sharkan, presenting Ibn Khaldun and his journey west and east, in which numerous documents regarding his life are quoted word for word. Abdurrahman bin Muhammad bin Muhammad bin Muhammad bin al Hassan bin Habir bin Muhammad bin Ibrahim bin Abdurrahman bin Ibn Khaldun, generally known as Ibn Khaldun, after a remote ancestor, was born in Tunis in AD 1332 732 AH into an upper-class Andalusian family of Arab descent. The family's ancestor was, according to him, a Yemeni Arab who shared kinship with Whale Ibn Hujr, a companion of the Islamic prophet Muhammad. His family, which held many high offices in Andalusia, had emigrated to Tunisia after the fall of Seville to the Reconquista in AD 1248. Under the Tunisian Hafsid dynasty, some of his family held political office, his father and grandfather, however, withdrew from political life and joined a mystical order. His brother, Yahya Khaldun, was also a historian who wrote a book on the Abdalwadid dynasty and was assassinated by a rival for being the official historiographer of the court. In his autobiography, Khaldun traces his descent back to the time of Muhammad through an Arab tribe from Yemen, specifically the Hadramat, which came to the Iberian Peninsula in the 8th century, at the beginning of the Islamic conquest. And our ancestry is from Hadramat, from the Arabs of Yemen, via Wail ibn Hujr, also known as Hujr ibn Adi, from the best of the Arabs, well known and respected p. 2429, all Warak's edition. However, the biographer Muhammad Enan questions his claim and suggests that his family may have been Mulattis who pretended to be of Arab origin to gain social status. Enan also mentions a well-documented past tradition that certain Berber groups delusively aggrandize themselves with some Arab ancestry. The motive of such inventions was always the desire for political and societal ascendancy. Some speculate that of the Khaldun family and elaborate that Ibn Khaldun himself was the product of the same Berber ancestry as the native majority of his birthplace. A point supporting that posits that his unusual focus on and admiration Maharlika Berbers reveals a deference towards them that is born of a vested interest in preserving them in the realm of conscious history. Islamic scholar Muhammad Hosian contends. The false Berber identity would be valid however at the time that Ibn Khaldun's ancestors left Andalusia and moved to Tunisia they did not change their claim to Arab ancestry. Even in the times when Berbers were ruling, the reigns of al-Marabats and al-Moahids, et al. the Ibn Khaldun's did not reclaim their Berber heritage. Khaldun's tracing of his own genealogy and surname are thought to be the strongest indication of Arab Yemenite ancestry. Education His family's high rank enabled Ibn Khaldun to study with the best teachers in Maghreb. He received a classical Islamic education, studying the Quran, which he memorized by heart, Arabic linguistics, the basis for understanding the Quran, Hadith, Sharia law, and Fiqh jurisprudence. He received certification for all of those subjects. The mathematician and philosopher al abali of Tulmsen introduced him to mathematics, logic and philosophy, and he studied especially the works of Averroes, Avicenna, Razi and Tusi. At the age of 17, Ibn Khaldun lost both his parents to the Black Death, an intercontinental epidemic of the plague that hit Tunis in 1348–1349. Following family tradition, he strove for a political career. 
in the face of a tumultuous political situation in North Africa, that required a high degree of skill in developing and dropping alliances prudently to avoid falling with the short-lived regimes of the time. Ibn Khaldun's autobiography is the story of an adventure, in which he spends time in prison, reaches the highest offices and falls again into exile. Political career At the age of 20, he began his political career at the chancellery of the Tunisian ruler Ibn Tafraqan with the position of Khatib al seal bearer, which consisted of writing in fine calligraphy the typical introductory notes of official documents. In 1352, Abu Ziyad, the Sultan of Constantine, marched on Tunis and defeated it. Ibn Khaldun, in any case unhappy with his respected but politically meaningless position, followed his teacher Abali to Fez. There, the Marinid Sultan, Abu Inan Fares I, appointed him as a writer of royal proclamations, but Ibn Khaldun still schemed against his employer, which, in 1357, got the 25-year-old a 22-month prison sentence. Upon the death of Abu Inan in 1358, Vizier al-Hasan ibn Umar granted him freedom and reinstated him to his rank and offices. Ibn Khaldun then schemed against Abu Inan's successor, Abu Salem Ibrahim III, with Abu Salem's exiled uncle, Abu Salem. When Abu Salem came to power, he gave Ibn Khaldun a ministerial position, the first position to correspond with Ibn Khaldun's ambitions. The treatment that Ibn Khaldun received after the fall of Abu Salem through Ibn Amar Abdullah, a friend of Ibn Khaldun's, was not to his liking, as he received no significant official position. At the same time, Amar successfully prevented Ibn Khaldun, whose political skills he knew well, from allying with the Abd al-Wadids in Tlemcen. Ibn Khaldun, therefore, decided to move to Granada. He could be sure of a positive welcome there since at Fez, he had helped the Sultan of Granada, the Nasra Muhammad V, regain power from his temporary exile. In 1364, Muhammad entrusted him with a diplomatic mission to the King of Castile, Pedro the Cruel, to endorse a peace treaty. Ibn Khaldun successfully carried out this mission and politely declined Pedro's offer to remain at his court and have his family's Spanish possessions returned to him. In Granada, Ibn Khaldun quickly came into competition with Muhammad's vizier, Ibn al-Khatib, who viewed the close relationship between Muhammad and Ibn Khaldun with increasing mistrust. Ibn Khaldun tried to shape the young Muhammad into his ideal of a wise ruler, an enterprise that Ibn al-Khatib thought foolish and a danger to peace in the country. History proved al-Khatib right, and at his instigation, Ibn Khaldun was eventually sent back to North Africa. Al-Khatib himself was later accused by Muhammad of having unorthodox philosophical views and murdered despite an attempt by Ibn Khaldun to intercede on behalf of his old rival. In his autobiography, Ibn Khaldun tells little about his conflict with Ibn al-Khatib and the reasons for his departure. Orientalist Musan Mahdi interprets that as showing that Ibn Khaldun later realized that he had completely misjudged Muhammad V. Back in Africa, the Hafsid Sultan of Bougie, Abu Abdallah, who had been his companion in prison, received him with great enthusiasm and made Ibn Khaldun his prime minister. Ibn Khaldun carried out a daring mission to collect taxes among the local Berber tribes. After the death of Abu Abdallah in 1366, Ibn Khaldun changed sides once again and allied himself with the Sultan of Tlemcen, Abu el Abbas. A few years later, he was taken prisoner by Abu Faris Abdul Aziz, who had defeated the Sultan of Tlemcen and seized the throne. He then entered a monastic establishment and occupied himself with scholastic duties until 1370. In that year, he was sent for to Tlemcen by the new Sultan. After the death of Abdu el Aziz, he resided at Fez, enjoying the patronage and confidence of the regent. Ibn Khaldun's political skills and, above all, his good relationship with the wild Berber tribes were in high demand among the North African rulers, but he had begun to tire of politics and constantly switching allegiances. In 1375, he was sent by Abu Hamu, the Abdu el Wadid Sultan of Tlemcen, on a mission to the Dawadida Arabs tribes of Biskra. After his return to the west, Ibn Khaldun sought refuge with one of the Berber tribes in the west of Algeria, in the town of Qalat ibn Salama. He lived there for over three years under their protection, taking advantage of his seclusion to write the Muqaddimah, Prolegomena, the introduction to his planned history of the world. In Ibn Salama, however, he lacked the necessary texts to complete the work. Therefore, in 1378, he returned to his native Tunis, which had meanwhile been conquered by Abu el-Abbas, who took Ibn Khaldun back into his service. 
There, he devoted himself almost exclusively to his studies and completed his history of the world. His relationship with Abu el Abbas remained strained, as the latter questioned his loyalty. That was brought into sharp contrast after Ibn Khaldun presented him with a copy of the completed history that omitted the usual panegyric to the ruler. Under pretense of going on the Hajj to Mecca, something a Muslim ruler could not simply refuse permission for Ibn Khaldun was able to leave Tunis and to sail to Alexandria. <laughs> Later life Ibn Khaldun said of Egypt, he who has not seen it does not know the power of Islam." While other Islamic regions had to cope with border wars and inner strife, the Mamluks let Egypt experience a period of economic prosperity and high culture. However, even in Egypt, where Ibn Khaldun lived out his days, he could not stay out of politics completely. In 1384, the Egyptian Sultan, al-Malik Udh Dahir Barkak, made him professor of the Kamhiya Madrasa and the Grand Qadi of the Maliki School of Fiqh one of four schools. The Maliki School was widespread primarily in Western Africa. His efforts at reform encountered resistance, however, and within a year, he had to resign his judgeship. A contributory factor to his decision to resign may have been the heavy personal blow that struck him in 1384, when a ship carrying his wife and children sank off the coast of Alexandria. Ibn Khaldun now decided to complete the pilgrimage to Mecca, after all. After his return in May 1388, Ibn Khaldun concentrated more strongly on a purely educational function at various Cairo madrasas. At court, he fell out of favor for a time, as during revolts against Barkak, he had, apparently under duress, with other Cairo jurists, issued a fatwa against Barkak. Later relations with Barkak returned to normal, and he was once again named the Maliki Qadi. Altogether, he was called six times to that high office, which, for various reasons, he never held long. In 1401, under Barkak's successor, his son Faraj, Ibn Khaldun took part in a military campaign against the Mongol conqueror, Timur, who besieged Damascus in 1400. Ibn Khaldun cast doubt upon the viability of the venture and really wanted to stay in Egypt. His doubts were vindicated, as the young and inexperienced Faraj, concerned about a revolt in Egypt, left his army to its own devices in Syria and hurried home. Ibn Khaldun remained at the besieged city for seven weeks, being lowered over the city wall by ropes to negotiate with Timur, in a historic series of meetings that he reported extensively in his autobiography. Timur questioned him in detail about conditions in the lands of the Maghreb. At his request, Ibn Khaldun even wrote a long report about it. As he recognized Timur's intentions, he did not hesitate, on his return to Egypt, to compose an equally extensive report on the history of the Tatars, together with a character study of Timur, sending them to the Marinid rulers in Fez Maghreb. Ibn Khaldun spent the next five years in Cairo completing his autobiography and his history of the world and acting as teacher and judge. Meanwhile, he was alleged to have joined an underground party, Rijal Hawa Rijal, whose reform-oriented ideals attracted the attention of local political authorities. The elderly Ibn Khaldun was placed under arrest. He died on 17 March 1406, one month after his sixth selection for the office of the Maliki Qadi judge. Works <laughs> 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 Kitab al-Ibar Ibn Khaldun's main work is the Kitab al-Ibar or Book of Lessons. Full title, Kitab al-Ibar wa Dawan al-Mutada wa al-Kabar fi ta rik al-Arab wa al-Barbar wa man asarahum min dawi ash shah n al-Akbar. Book of Lessons, Record of Beginnings and Events in the History of the Arabs and the Berbers and Their Powerful Contemporaries. Originally conceived as a history of the Berbers but later expanded in focus to a universal history. The Kitab al-Ibar divides into seven books. al introduction is considered the first book. Books 2-5 cover world history of humanity up to the author's own time. Books 6 and 7 give the history of the Berber peoples and the Maghreb. Despite errors originating in the 14th century Fez work, Rod al Kurdis, probably by Ibn Abi Zar, from which Khaldun drew upon, al Ibar remains an important source for Berber history. 
The historiographical work has been further criticized for its synthesis of multiple sometimes contradictory sources in the absence of original citations, and here Calden departs from the classical style of Arab historians such as Ibrahim ibn ar tilde d.1028 or al-Maliki. Concerning the discipline of sociology, he described the dichotomy of sedentary life versus nomadic life as well as the inevitable loss of power that occurs when warriors conquer a city. According to the Arab scholar Sati al Husri, the Muqaddimah may be read as a sociological work. The work is based around Ibn Khaldun's central concept of asabiya, which has been translated as social cohesion, group solidarity, or tribalism. This social cohesion arises spontaneously in tribes and other small kinship groups, it can be intensified and enlarged by a religious ideology. Ibn Khaldun's analysis looks at how this cohesion carries groups to power but contains within itself the seeds, psychological, sociological, economic, political, of the group's downfall, to be replaced by a new group, dynasty or empire bound by a stronger or at least younger and more vigorous cohesion. Some of Ibn Khaldun's views, particularly those concerning the Zanj people of sub-Saharan Africa, have been cited as a racist, though they were not uncommon for their time. According to the scholar Abdelmajid Hanum, Ibn Khaldun's description of the distinctions between Berbers and Arabs were misinterpreted by the translator William McGuckin de Slane, who wrongly inserted a racial ideology that sets Arabs and Berbers apart and in opposition into his translation of the Muqaddimah. Perhaps the most frequently cited observation drawn from Ibn Khaldun's work is the notion that when a society becomes a great civilization and, presumably, the dominant culture in its region, its high point is followed by a period of decay. This means that the next cohesive group that conquers the diminished civilization is, by comparison, a group of barbarians. Once the barbarians solidify their control over the conquered society, however, they become attracted to its more refined aspects, such as literacy and arts, and either assimilate into or appropriate such cultural practices. Then, eventually, the former barbarians will be conquered by a new set of barbarians, who will repeat the process. One contemporary reader of Calden has read this as an early business cycle theory, though set in the historical circumstances of the mature Islamic empire, Ibn Khaldun outlines an early example of political economy. He describes the economy as being composed of value-adding processes, that is, labor and skill is added to techniques and crafts and the product is sold at a higher value. He also made the distinction between profit and sustenance. In modern political economy terms, surplus and that required for the reproduction of classes respectively. He also calls for the creation of a science to explain society and goes on to outline these ideas in his major work, the Muqaddimah. Ibn Khaldun diverged from norms that Muslim historians followed and rejected their focus on the credibility of the transmitter and focused instead on the validity of the stories and encouraged critical thinking. Ibn Khaldun also believed that the currency of an Islamic monetary system should have intrinsic value and therefore be made of gold and silver, such as the dirham. He emphasized that the weight and purity of these coins should be strictly followed, the weight of one dinar should be one mythical the weight of 72 grains of barley, roughly 4.25 grams and the weight of seven dinar should be equal to weight of ten dirhams seven-tenths of a mythical or 2.96 grams. Topic. Social thought Ibn Khaldun's epistemology attempted to reconcile mysticism with theology by dividing science into two different categories, the religious science that regards the sciences of the Quran and the non-religious science. He further classified the non-religious sciences into intellectual sciences such as logic, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, etc. and auxiliary sciences such as language, literature, poetry, etc. He also suggested that possibly more divisions will appear in the future with different societies. He tried to adapt to all possible societies' cultural behavior and influence in education, economics and politics. Nonetheless, he didn't think that laws were chosen by just one leader or a small group of individual but mostly by the majority of the individuals of a society. To Ibn Khaldun, the state was a necessity of human society to restrain injustice within the society, but the state means as force, thus itself an injustice. All societies must have a state governing them in order to establish a society. He attempted to standardize the history of societies by identifying ubiquitous phenomena present in all societies. 
To him, civilization was a phenomena that will be present as long as humans exist. He characterized the fulfillment of basic needs as the beginning of civilization. At the beginning, people will look for different ways of increasing productivity of basic needs and expansion will occur. Later the society starts becoming more sedentary and focuses more on crafting, arts and the more refined characteristics. By the end of a society, it will weaken, allowing another small group of individuals to come into control. The conquering group is described as an unsatisfied group within the society itself or a group of desert bandits that constantly attack other weaker or weakened societies. In the Mukaddima, his most important work, he thoughtfully and scrupulously discusses an introduction of philosophy to history in a general manner, based on observable patterns within a theoretical framework of known historical events of his time. He described the beginnings, development, cultural trends and the fall of all societies, leading to the rise of a new society which would then follow the same trends in a continuous cycle. Ibn Khaldun did not create a perfect model for a society during his life, but he did think there was a need for a new model to manage society to ensure its continuous economic growth. Also, he recommended the best political approaches to develop a society according to his knowledge of history. He heavily emphasized that a good society would be one in which a tradition of education is deeply rooted in its culture. Ibn Khaldun 1987 introduced word asabiya solidarity, group feeling, or group consciousness, to explain tribalism. The concept of asabiya has been translated as social cohesion, group solidarity, or tribalism. This social cohesion arises spontaneously in tribes and other small kinship groups Rash, 2017. Ibn Khaldun believed that too much bureaucracy, such as taxes and legislations, would lead to the decline of a society, since it would constrain the development of more specialized labor increase in scholars and development of different services. He believed that bureaucrats cannot understand the world of commerce and do not possess the same motivation as a businessman. In his work The Mukaddima, Ibn Khaldun emphasizes human beings' faculty to think FIKR as what determines human behavior and ubiquitous patterns. This faculty is also what inspires human beings to form into a social structure to cooperate in division of labor and organization. According to Zeta Mond in Epistemology and the Human Dimension in Urban Studies, the FIKR faculty is the supporting pillar for all philosophical aspects of Ibn Khaldun's theory related to human beings' spiritual, intellectual, physical, social and political tendencies. Another important concept he emphasizes in his work is the mastery of crafts, habits and skills. These takes place after a society is established and according to Ibn Khaldun the level of achievement of a society can be determined by just analyzing these three concepts. A society in its earliest stages is nomadic and primarily concerned with survival, while a society at a later stage is sedentary, with greater achievement in crafts. A society with a sedentary culture and stable politics would be expected to have greater achievements in crafts and technology. Ibn Khaldun also emphasized in his epistemology theory the important aspect that educational tradition plays to ensure the new generations of a civilization continuously improve in the sciences and develop culture. Ibn Khaldun argued that without the strong establishment of an educational tradition, it would be very difficult for the new generations to maintain the achievements of the earlier generations, let alone improve them. Another way to distinguish the achievement of a society would be the language factor of a society, since for him the most important element of a society would not be land, but the language spoken by them. He was surprised that many non-Arabs were really successful in the Arabic society, had good jobs and were well received by the community. These people were non-Arab by descent, but they grew up among the Arabs who possessed the habit of Arabic." Ibn Khaldun once recalled, "...b a cause of this, they were able to master Arabic so well that they cannot be surpassed." He believed that the reason why non-Arabs were accepted as part of Arab society was due to their mastery of the Arabic language. Advancements in literary works such as poems and prose were another way to distinguish the achievement of a civilization, but Ibn Khaldun believed that whenever the literary facet of a society reaches its highest levels it ceases to indicate societal achievements anymore, but as an embellishment of life. For logical sciences he established knowledge at its highest level as an increase of scholars and the quality of knowledge. For him the highest level of literary productions would be the manifestation of prose, poems and the artistic enrichment of a society. Topic. Minor works 
From other sources we know of several other works, primarily composed during the time he spent in North Africa and Al-Andalus. His first book, Lubabu el Mahassal, a commentary on the Islamic theology of Fakhr al-Din al-Razi, was written at the age of 19 under the supervision of his teacher al abali in Tunis. A work on Sufism, Shifayu el Sayyil, was composed around 1373 in Fez, Morocco. Whilst at the court of Muhammad v, Sultan of Granada, Ibn Khaldun composed a work on logic, Alakali s Sultan. Legacy Egypt Ibn Khaldun's historical method had very few precedents or followers in his time. While Ibn Khaldun is known to have been a successful lecturer on jurisprudence within religious sciences, only very few of his students were aware of, and influenced by, his Muqaddimah. One such student, al makrizi praised the Muqaddima, although some scholars have found his praise, and that of others, to be generally empty and lacking understanding of Ibn Khaldun's methods. Ibn Khaldun also faced primarily criticism from his contemporaries, particularly Ibn Hajar al Askalani. These criticisms included accusations of inadequate historical knowledge, an inaccurate title, disorganization, and a style resembling that of the prolific Arab literature writer, al Jahiz. Al Asqalani also noted that Ibn Khaldun was not well liked in Egypt because he opposed many respected traditions, including the traditional judicial dress, and suggested that this may have contributed to the reception of Ibn Khaldun's historical works. The notable exception to this consensus was Ibn al Azraq, a jurist who lived shortly after Ibn Khaldun and quoted heavily from the first and fourth books of the Kitab al Ibar in developing a work of mirrors for princes. Topic. Ottoman Empire Ibn Khaldun's work found some recognition with Ottoman intellectuals in the 17th century. The first references to Ibn Khaldun in Ottoman writings appeared in the middle of the 17th century, with historians such as Khatib Celebi naming him as a great influence, while another Turkish Ottoman historian, Mustafa Naima, attempted to use Ibn Khaldun's cyclical theory of the rise and fall of empires to describe the Ottoman Empire. Increasing perceptions of the decline of the Ottoman Empire also caused similar ideas to appear independently of Ibn Khaldun in the 16th century, and may explain some of the influence of his works. <laughs> Europe In Europe, Ibn Khaldun was first brought to the attention of the Western world in 1697, when a biography of him appeared in Barthélemy d'Herbalat de Molainville's Bibliothèque Orientale. However, some scholars believe that Ibn Khaldun's work may have first been introduced to Europe via Ibn Arabsha's biography of Tamerlane, translated to Latin, which covers a meeting between Ibn Khaldun and Tamerlane. According to Ibn Arabsha, during this meeting, Ibn Khaldun and Tamerlane discussed the Maghrib in depth, as well as Tamerlane's genealogy and place in history. Ibn Khaldun began gaining more attention from 1806, when Silvestre de Sacy's Crestomathy Arabe included his biography together with a translation of parts of the Muqaddimah as the Prolegomena. In 1816, de Sacy again published a biography with a more detailed description on the Prolegomena. More details on and partial translations of the Prolegomena emerged over the years until the complete Arabic edition was published in 1858. Since then, the work of Ibn Khaldun has been extensively studied in the Western world with special interest. Early European works on Ibn Khaldun suffered heavily from colonial influences and Orientalism, as many sociologists considered North Africa to be unworthy of studying in the 19th century. Additionally, many sociologists viewed Ibn Khaldun as the only North African sociologist worth studying. Reynold A. Nicholson praised Ibn Khaldun as a uniquely brilliant Muslim sociologist, but discounted Khaldun's influence. Spanish philosopher José Ortega y Gasset viewed the conflicts of North Africa as a problem that stemmed from a lack of African thought, and praised Ibn Khaldun for making sense of the conflict by simplifying it to the relationship between the nomadic and sedentary modes of life. Ibn Khaldun's contributions to economics were ignored by historians like Joseph Schumpeter, who wrote that we may safely leap over 500 years to the epoch of St. Thomas Aquinas." As late as 1954. While Ibn Khaldun lived after St. Thomas Aquinas, Schumpeter makes only passing references to Khaldun, and excludes Khaldun's predecessors. 
However, modern historians have recognized the contributions of Ibn Khaldun and many of his predecessors. Topic: <laughs> Modern historians. Modern historians have also been complementary in their analysis of Ibn Khaldun's works, and acknowledgement of his contemporaries or standing compared to European scholars is increasingly common. Influential British historian and international affairs specialist Arnold J. Toynbee has called Ibn Khaldun's Muqaddimah, the greatest work of its kind. Ernest Gellner, once a professor of philosophy and logic at the London School of Economics, considered Khaldun's definition of government the best in the history of political theory. More moderate views on the scope of Ibn Khaldun's contributions have emerged. Arthur Laffer, for whom the Laffer curve is named, acknowledged that Ibn Khaldun's ideas, as well as others, precede his own work on that curve. A focus on understanding the nuances of Ibn Khaldun's contributions is present, with scholars commenting on the specifics of Khaldun's work, such as, "...Ibn Khaldun chose to ignore all those crafts which are neither necessary, nor honorable," and that Ibn Khaldun, "...depicts what really happens, he does not discuss whether the state ought, or ought not, to interfere." As a historian and sociologist, Ibn Khaldun was recognized by the British philosopher Robert Flint, who wrote, as a theorist of history he had no equal in any age or country until Vico appeared, more than three hundred years later. Plato, Aristotle, and Augustine were not his peers, and all others were unworthy of being even mentioned along with him." Ibn Khaldun's work on evolution of societies also influenced Egan Oroen, who termed the concept of socionomy. While Ibn Khaldun's record-keeping is usually passed over in favor of recognizing his contributions to the science of history, Abderrahman e Laksasi wrote, "...no historian of the Maghreb since and particularly of the Berbers can do without his historical contribution." <laughs> Public recognition Public recognition of Ibn Khaldun has increased in recent years. In 2004, the Tunisian Community Center launched the first Ibn Khaldun Award to recognize a Tunisian, American high achiever whose work reflects Ibn Khaldun's ideas of kinship and solidarity. The award was named after Ibn Khaldun for him being universally acknowledged as the father of sociology and also for the convergence of his ideas with the organization's objectives and programs. In 2006, the Atlas Economic Research Foundation launched an annual essay contest for students named in Ibn Khaldun's honor. The theme of the contest is, "...how individuals, think tanks, universities and entrepreneurs can influence government policies to allow the free market to flourish and improve the lives of its citizens based on Islamic teachings and traditions." In 2006, Spain commemorated the 600th anniversary of the death of Ibn Khaldun, by orchestrating an exhibit titled, "...Encounter of Civilizations, Ibn Khaldun." In 2011, Ibn Khaldun's birthday was recognized by a Google Doodle, which was publicized in North Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. Bibliography Kitab al Ibar wa Dawan al Mutada wa el Kabar fi ta rik al Arab wa el Barber wa man asaraham min dawi ash shah n al Akbar. Lubabu el Mahasil fi Yuswoalu di Deen, Shifayu s Sayil, Al Laka li s Sultan, Ibn Khaldun. 1951 Al Trif Babin Kledon World Gerba Shirka al Ta Rif by Ibn Khaldun wa Rilachuhu Garban wa Sharkin. Published by Muhammad ibn Tawit at Tanji. Cairo. Autobiography in Arabic. Ibn Khaldun. 1958 The Muqaddimah, An Introduction to History. Translated from the Arabic by Franz Rosenthal, 3 vols. New York, Princeton. Ibn Khaldun. 1967 The Muqaddima, An Introduction to History. Trans. Franz Rosenthal, ed. N. J. Dawood, abridged. Topic see also topic Notes topic References topic Sources Fuad Bali. 2005 The Science of Human Social Organization, Conflicting Views on Ibn Khaldun's 1332-1406 ILM al-Umran. Mellon Studies in Sociology. Lewiston, N.Y., Edwin Mellon Press. Walter Fischel. 1967 Ibn Khaldun in Egypt, His Public Functions and His Historical Research, 1382-1406, A Study in Islamic Historiography. Berkeley, University of California Press. 
Alan Fromhers. 2010. Ibn Khaldun, Life and Times. Edinburgh University Press, 2010. Anna Maria C. Meinkan, 2012. El vinculo comunitario y el poder en Ibn Jaldan in José Miguel Marinas, ed. Pensar lo político, Enseos sobre comunidad y conflicto, Biblioteca Nueva, Madrid, 2012. Mahmoud Rabi. 1967. The Political Theory of Ibn Khaldun. Leiden, E.J. Brill. Robert Simon. 2002 Ibn Khaldun, History as Science and the Patrimonial Empire. Translated by Clara Pogatsa. Budapest, Akademiae Kiato. Original edition, 1999. Topic external links Topic English Ibn Khaldun, His Life and Work, by Muhammad Hosian Ibn Khaldun on In Our Time at the BBC Rosenthal, Franz 1970-80. Ibn Khaldun. Complete Dictionary of Scientific Biography. Encyclopedia.com. Complete Mukaddima, Kitab al Ibar in English without Chapter 5, 13. The Tunisian American Center, USA, Ibn Khaldun on the Web Muslim Scientists and Scholars, Ibn Khaldun Ibn Khaldun's Philosophy of Management and Work Ibn Khaldun al Mukaddima, Methodology and Concepts of Economic Sociology Ibn Khaldun. The Mediterranean in the 14th Century, Rise and Fall of Empires. Andalusian Legacy Exhibition in the Alcazar of Seville The Ibn Khaldun Community Service Award Copyright Ibn Khaldun Meets Al Saud The Ibn Khaldun Institute The Tunisian American Day Copyright Topic Non-English Multilingual Tunisian Academic Website on Ibn Khaldun in French Exposé Simplifié sur la théologie scholastique Chapters from the Muqaddima and the History of Ibn Khaldun in Arabic Ismail Kupeli, Ibn Khaldun und das politische System Sirens, Eine Gegenüberstellung, München, 2007 7, ISBN 978-3-638-75458-3 German e-book about the politics of Syria with reference to the political theory of Ibn Khaldun Kuchinov A.M. Ibn Khaldun Influence on Social Thought Development, Lomonosov 2013, Moscow, 2013. In Russian.